Thank you for choosing to spend a wonderful late summer day within these four very elegant walls. And uh, also to invite me to kind of share with you my interest and passion of treating patients with diabetes, a slightly different take from uh, the other presentation. And over the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to go and start a little bit about background epidemiology of diabetes. Then I'm going to show you some data linking glucose levels and cardiovascular disease, quickly summarize why diabetes is seen as a prothrombotic condition, and then going really to the treatment phase, what, is there any role for glycemic control in cardiovascular disease prevention, and are there any other intervention in which we can really prevent cardiovascular disease in the diabetic patient. So let's start uh, with uh, a few data about diabetes. We are clearly in the midst of a pandemic of diabetes. These are worldwide projection and data. Now here is uh, 1985, I start my residency at the University of California, San Diego. There are worldwide about 30 million diabetic patients. You would argue that diabetes was not a great career choice at that time. But as time goes by, there is really these pandemics. Now we are reaching about 300 million worldwide diabetic patients. So it's a tenfold increase over this short time interval. And the projection is this is going to grow even further. And moreover, if you just don't consider diabetes, but if you consider all the patients that have what we call impaired glucose tolerance, so glucose levels that are not in a normal level but not high enough to qualify people for diabetes, we are adding another about four to 500 million patients worldwide. So we are reaching a billion worldwide. Now in the US, these are the recent data, this is still 2007, but about 8% of the US population has diabetes. And in three, interestingly, even with all the awareness campaign, we have about a third of the patients that are undiagnosed and two thirds that are diagnosed. So there is still a large amount of patients that show to our hospital, they show to primary care physician, they don't know they have diabetes and they definitely do have it. Now, most of the data that I'm going to show you when I talk about diabetes, I'm talking about type two diabetes. This is still 90 to 95% of diabetes in the US. And there are some difference, clearly in treatment, but potentially also in cardiovascular disease. But I think what is really scaring are these data. The pro current projection show that one out of three kids born in 2000 will develop diabetes unless we do something about it. And because minority children have a higher genetic propensity for type two diabetes, one out of two minority kids will develop diabetes during their lifetime. So this is a huge uh, societal problem. And of course, if we talk about type two diabetes, the incidence goes up with aging. So above age 60, almost 20% of the population has type two diabetes. Not a difference between gender, men and women. And if we look at different patient population, if you go to the cardiac surgery units in our hospital, cardiac unit, about 30, 35, 40% of the population has diabetes. Now, why there is this huge pandemics of diabetes? Clearly because of the pandemics of obesity. And we are now at the stage in which 68% of US adults are overweight or obese. And I'm going to show you the data that link obesity and diabetes. And this is not only the US, and actually I think that for the for last few years, the US lost the record of being the most overweight or obese country in the world. I think that now some countries in the Middle East have an even higher incidence of obesity and also of diabetes. And it's clearly not just an issue about uh, food availability. I think that the, the next slide really summarizes why there is this uh, epidemics or pandemics of diabetes is food availability and the television, and basically physical inactivity. Now, in a number of surveys, 40% of adults say they don't do any physical activity at all. When other uh, surveys showed that 31% of US adults say that they are doing at least 20 minutes of exercise five days a week. But I warn you, most of them are lying. Because when we give them pedometers, accelerometers, so you can really measure physical activity, only 5% of US adults, they do 30 minutes of moderate activity five days a week. And this threshold has been shown because in the diabetes prevention program and other studies, this degree of activity was effective in uh, reducing the prevalence of diabetes by 60% and was much more effective than any medication that we have. 
Now, these are data that I found interesting. This is data from the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. And of course, uh, you all can relate to the five hours of free time that the US adult has, leisure time per day. But what are we doing with our leisure time? We are spending in front of the TV. And if you look at the data in details, the U US adults spend on average 17 minutes of exercising or recreation. So we are basically spending 6% of the leisure time exercising. And unless we really work in terms of uh, uh, more exercise, less food, decrease obesity, we are really not going to fight and win this battle against diabetes. And why is that? Because the relation between obesity and diabetes is incredibly strict. So now this is data from an old study, the nurse's health study. If you take a nurse uh, that is obese and you follow this nurse for 14 years, what is the relative risk of developing diabetes compared to a normal weight nurse? It's about 30 to 100 folds higher. If you take a nurse that is in the overweight state, this is BMI, so you see that the risk is about five to about 30 fold higher than a normal weight person. And interestingly enough, even in the normal weight category, someone that has a BMI of 24 already has double or triple the risk of developing diabetes than someone that has a BMI of 22. So it's really incredibly tightly controlled the risk, the linkage between obesity and diabetes. Now, what about glucose, con glucose level and cardiovascular disease? Well, there are lots of studies, and interestingly enough, not just in the diabetic range, but even in the normal range. So this is a study of normal individual, and if you divide a normal individual by average glucose levels, by hemoglobin A1c, and this is the normal range, 4.9 to 5.4, different quantile, and if you look at cardiovascular mortality, unadjusted, or if you look at cardiovascular mortality adjusted, or all-cause mortality, the higher is the glucose levels, the highest is the cardiovascular mortality, even in the normal range. These are patients that have absolutely normal glucose tolerance. Other studies like this, this is the Paris Perspective study, they have divided patients based on glucose category. So the orange here is normal glucose tolerance, this is known diabetes, and these are the patients that were classified as having impaired glucose tolerance or newly diagnosed diabetes. And again, if you look, the cardiovascular mortality, the higher is the glucose, the higher is the cardiovascular mortality. And finally, if you take patients with type 2 diabetes and you look at how tightly controlled they are in terms of glycemic control, so you look at them with the low, middle, of high A1C tertile, both cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular event are higher in patients that have a higher hemoglobin A1C. The higher is the A1C, the highest is the mortality or the cardiovascular disease risk. So we definitely know that, uh, and these are very old data from the Framingham study, that diabetes is really a cardiovascular risk factor. So these are the patient with diabetes in the, per, in the light blue line, and these are patients without diabetes. So if you have patient with diabetes and no other cardiovascular risk factor, those are the, are the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, smoking, hypertension, etc. The cardiovascular mortality rate was even higher than a non-diabetic with one risk cardiovascular risk factor, and the curve are really exactly the same slope, just a higher elevation. And then, of course, Steve Hafner doing studies in Finland, type 2 diabetic patient. This is looking at the incidence of fatal or non-fatal MI in relation to ACE or prior MI. If you follow this patient for seven years, you, on the left-hand side you have non-diabetic patient, and on the right-hand side you have diabetic patient. And so if you have a non-diabetic patient without prior history of MI, follow by seven years, this is the risk of an MI. A non-diabetic patient with prior history of MI, much higher risk, and a diabetic patient without any cardiovascular history before, they have a much higher risk of uh, fan MI, the same as a non-diabetic with prior cardiovascular risk. And of course, if you are unlucky and you have both diabetes and a prior MI, the risk of developing a second MI is really high. And not only you have more heart attacks, but you also have a worse outcome. And these are again showing mortality following coronary, acute coronary syndromes, uh, and the light lines are the diabetic compared to the non-diabetics, and 
diabetics, they have a double roughly the mortality for both ST wave MI or unstable angina and non-ST wave MI. So clearly patients with diabetes, they have more heart disease and their outcome from their heart disease are worse than non-diabetic patients. And we think that part of this is because diabetes is seen as a prothrombotic condition. Now, I'm not going to show you the data because there is a huge literature which is mostly in in vitro studies, animal models of diabetes, some studies, human studies. We all are very familiar with the trom big thrombus in a coronary artery. That is what is actually bringing most of you here today. But it's interesting that diabetic patients, they also have a thrombotic propensity in many different vessels. This is an interesting study. This is a trypsin digest of a human retina from a diabetic patient. This is a sixth of the retina, and these are the area where large thrombi were found. Now, if you do this in this study, they, when you compare non-diabetic versus diabetic patient, the incidence of thrombi in the retinal circulature was about three to four, four higher in diabetic versus non-diabetic. So clearly, it's not just the large coronary arteries or the cerebrovascular arteries, but there is the microvasculature as well that is affected by thrombotic events. And there are a number of conditions. I mean, in diabetic models, uh, in uh, animal models of diabetes, in diabetic patients, there have been a lot of platelet abnormalities. Hypercoagulability has been described. There is a lot of huge literature about the endothelial dysfunction, decreased fibrinolysis. So all these mechanisms potentially predispose diabetic patients to an increased risk of thrombosis and increased risk of cardiovascular events. Now let's go at the intervention. Can we do something? Is the glycemic control going to prevent cardiovascular disease? And so the essential question uh, when you see all our diabetic patients every day is, will treatment of hyperglycemia reduce diabetic complication? And clearly for microvascular disease, the consensus is yes, lots of studies. Retinal disease, renal disease, neurological disease is decreased in patients with better glucose control. But for large, large vessel disease, it's a little bit more complex, the picture. So in patient with, the, if you take a patient sudden, immediately after the onset of disease, younger, healthier patient with low cardiovascular disease risk, and you tightly control from onset, you potentially prevent cardiovascular disease. But if you have patient that had a number of years of diabetes and they have already a significant load in terms of atherosclerotic disease, glycemic control is probably not going to do much. And I'm going to show you some of the studies from which these data are coming from. So endocrinologists are always jealous of cardiologists because you have many more interesting acronyms, but our randomized trial are few. And of course, the two more important are the DCCT, which was a large study of type 1 diabetic patient, or the UKPDS, large study of type 2 diabetic patient. Now, these were randomized controlled trial of patient with a short duration of disease within a few years maximum of, of onset of the disease. And they were tightly controlled or less tightly controlled with an A1C of seven versus nine that was achieved in these, or eight versus seven, and followed for about 6.5 to 10 years. And at the end of the study, clearly there was much less microvascular disease in better control, and in terms of cardiovascular events, there were no benefits. But of course, investigators like to follow their patient for a long time. So all, both cohorts were after the, the end of the randomized control trial were followed up. Now the problem is that, and this is very important to recognize, when you go from a randomized control trial to send your patient back to primary care physician, to the endocrinologist, whoever was taking care of this diabetic patient, their hemoglobin A1C got worse in the intensively control, but in the poorly controlled got a little bit better and there was no more difference. And these patients were follow up for a number of other years, nine to 10 years. And at the end of this longer period of observation, now there was also a decrease in cardiovascular event which was puzzling. So this is at the end of randomized trial. Hemoglobin A1C was different, but then we have another eight years in which the A1C is the same. And if you see what happened in terms of cardiovascular events,